Hello and welcome to today's internal medicine webinar. My name is Lydia Morgan and I'm commercial manager here at Virtual Veterinary Specialists. I'll be introducing our speaker for today, Dr. Jessica Adamany, with her, the second in her series of four lunchtime internal medicine webinars. The topic she'll be covering today is cobalamin disorders in the dog and cat. If you missed last week's webinar on transfusion medicine in the anemic cat, you can catch up on our YouTube channel. You can also find links to the recording on all of our social media feeds. VVS have a team of friendly and knowledgeable veterinary specialists who can support you with advice calls, written reports, radiology requests, or with our HALO service, our live guided specialist consultations. These include specialist live guided cardiology workups and live guided abdominal ultrasound with internal medicine review. Our internal medicine advice calls and written reports can be accessed by any veterinary team. There's no need to register or subscribe, so you can keep your cases in-house by bringing VVS in. For those of you attending London Vet Show this year, we hope you'll come and say hello and visit us at stand P45. We're lucky to announce that we'll be joined by Jessica Adamany on the Friday of the show, as well as other members of the VVS specialist team over the two days. Come and speak to us so we can answer any questions you might have about VVS and how we can help you to offer a specialist service to your patients in-house. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jessica Adamany, European Specialist in Small Animal Internal Medicine. In 2013, Jessica undertook a residency in internal medicine at Pride Veterinary Centre, becoming a European diplomat in internal medicine in 2017. She's remained at Pride as a senior medicine clinician, co-director of the Rotating Internship Programme and Resident Supervisor. She is passionate about teaching and we're so lucky to have her on the team, bringing her dedication knowledge as well as her compassion and understanding to VVS. So if you have any questions as we go through the webinar, please add them to the chat box and we'll finish up the presentation with a question and answer session at the end. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Jess for today's talk on cobalamin. Perfect. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Let's see if I can... There we go. All right. So today, as Lydia said, I will be speaking about cobalamin disorders in the dog and cat. This lecture will be slightly shorter than the one last week. Um, I find cobalamin extremely interesting and it can be extremely helpful uh, in specific diseases, um, but there's just not as much to say as in uh, transfusion medicine for the cat. So first I'd like to give you guys a brief uh, review of the molecule. So cobalamin is otherwise known as vitamin B12. It is a water soluble vitamin and it's mainly found in animal tissue and animal byproducts. So we will see it, it will be present in a lot of the foods that our dogs and cats are eating and also that we eat ourselves. Um, however, you know, in foods that let's say are vegan or have, um, are using other protein sources, often it will be supplemented with cobalamin. So, it is important because it is a cofactor, uh, so it is needed for the action of certain enzymes. So the enzymes that cobalamin is needed for is methionine synthase and methylmalonyl coa A mutase. And with these, en these enzymes are important for DNA and fatty acid synthesis, neuronal function, and hematopoiesis. So as I mentioned before, it is something that we find in the diet. Um, so we're initially going to speak about how it's absorbed from our food. Um, so we find it in the diet. It is complex a dietary protein. This dietary protein is then removed from the cobalamin in the stomach by pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid. In the stomach, free cobalamin immediately then binds to transcobalamin 1, which you'll also see uh, called R-protein, and then is carried to the duodenum, where it is freed again by pancreatic proteases. This free cobalamin then binds something known as, it's lots of switching around, but then binds intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is released by mainly by the exocrine pancreas, okay, in the dog and in the cat, a little bit by the stomach, but the exocrine pancreas is very important for this intrinsic factor. And that intrinsic factor binds the free cobalamin, and then it is this complex together that then goes to um, the ileum, travels down to the ileum, and at the brush border is then absorbed through the, the end or into the enterocytes via endocytosis. So I wanted to put this diagram here um, 
I am a visual learner. So for those that it's easier to kind of visualize what's going on, let's see if I can use my, my mouse. Um, so initially the food comes in into the stomach. Um, you have cobalamin with dietary protein that then is um, released by hydrochloric acid and the pepsinogens. And then here it binds to the R protein, travels to the duodenum and the duodenum, um, the pancreatic proteases then release it. Okay, so then it's free again, and then it binds to the intrinsic factor that is also released by the pancreas. And there, this complex can travel down to the ileum, where then this complex is required to bind to a specific receptor. It's called a QBAM receptor, as we'll see in the next slide. And then it is absorbed by endocytosis, okay, into um, the enterocyte. So again, cobalamin is complex to intrinsic factor. And so it is this complex that is required. And we'll speak later with certain diseases about why this intrinsic factor is important. But it is required for ileal absorption at that specific receptor in the ileum called the QBAM receptor in humans. And therefore, we also assume in dogs and in cats, um, there's about 1% of absorption of cobalamin via passive diffusion. So although the majority of cobalamin absorption needs this uh, complex intrinsic factor cobalamin and with this specific receptor, about 1% is absorbed via passive diffusion. The receptor has two different subunits and I've listed them, listed them here. Um, this receptor is also found in the kidney uh, and is involved with absorption of proteins, okay? So following absorption into the enterocyte, cobalamin is then released from the intrinsic factor. It is then bound to transcobalamin two and is transferred into the bloodstream. At the target tissue, cobalamin is released by transcobalamin two and enters the cell via specific receptors. We know that cobalamin works intracellularly in the mitochondria. So it needs to get to this area and then it is used within the mitochondria for these specific enzymes. So again, another picture or schematic to show you um, what's going on. So you have over here, intrinsic factor and cobalamin on the left. Uh, they bind together, they make it to the ileal brush border where there is this QBAM receptor that has the two subunits. It binds to that receptor. It is taken into the cell via endocytosis, and then it can bind to transcobalamin 2 and enter the blood and travel to the target tissue. So methods of measurement. Uh, the one that we often use is serum cobalamin. So I'm sure everyone um, that's here measures serum cobalamin quite a bit. So it's an easy way. You take a blood sample, you send off the serum, and they can tell you what the serum cobalamin is. But it's important that we realize, again, that cobalamin is used intracellularly. So although we can measure serum cobalamin, it will not reflect kind of the whole body cobalamin status, and most importantly, what's going on in the cell. There is another method that, so there's two different ways that we can determine if there is a cellular deficiency of cobalamin. One is measuring homocysteine. It's been shown in people and in dogs and cats. It can be elevated when there is an intracellular deficiency of cobalamin. Uh, however, it, it's affected by too many other things and therefore is not um, a reliable source, I guess, or a reliable uh, measurement to take. So serum cobalamin is the best way to do screening. And then we use methylmalonic acid. You can measure it in the serum or in the urine. It is very stable and this will increase in cases where there is a cellular deficiency um, of cobalamin. It is can be affected by other things, mainly if you have renal disease or if there's um, dehydration, but unlike homocysteine, uh, there's less factors that, that affect its measurement. So cobalamin status uh, can be broken up into almost four different categories. So we have hypercobalaminemia. We will speak about this towards the end, very briefly, towards the end of the discussion um, or towards the end of the, the presentation. We have normal normocobalaminemia. So these reference ranges are ones that are made by Texas A&M that do a lot of the research on cobalamin. However, a lot of your labs will also use similar reference ranges. What we do know is that you can have about 12% of dogs with chronic enteropathy that will have a normal cobalamin, um, but they also have an elevated MMA. So there is some intracellular deficiency, okay? And I think it's about 20 to 25% of 
dogs with a low normal cobalamin um, will also have an elevated MMA. So again, a normal looks like body cabal cabalamin status, but really intracellularly, it is uh, deficient, okay? And then below that, we have patients that have hypocobalaminemia, okay? And then there is this newer term that, that we are using, it's called cobalamin deficiency. It is when the cobalamin level is below the level of detection of the assay, and also the MMA is elevated. So first I'd like to focus on hypocobalaminemia. We'll speak about kind of clinical signs, blood work changes we can have with the disease um, or with hypocobalaminemia. We'll speak about specific uh, causes of hypocobalaminemia um, and what that means and why we should or shouldn't treat, okay? So first causes of hypocobalaminemia, they can be inherited or acquired. So there is a disease uh, called immerslund grosbeck syndrome. So we'll call it IGS from now on. And this has been reported in children, in human children. Uh, and we do see it in specific breeds, okay? So it's an autosomal recessive uh, disease. I have tried my best to find one of these cases and still have yet to find one, but I think I'm hoping to find one in my career. Um, we also have border collies that can have IGS, but they also... There's quite a few border collies that will have uh, a normal serum cobalamin, but they have elevated methylmalonic aciduria. So for some reason, there is a deficiency of intracellular cobalamin in some border collies. And some border collies are asymptomatic with this disease, while others will have similar signs to uh, patients with just uh, serum cobalamin deficiency, okay? Um, I don't think we quite know exactly why it happens. We don't know if it's a transport problem um, or an enzyme problem, but it is something that's good for you to keep an eye on. There's quite a few papers looking at border collies with just this primary methylmalonic aciduria. We also have Sharpays that can have um, inherited hypocobalaminemia. It's not the same as that we know of. It's not the same as Imerslung grosbeck syndrome. Um, where we know the specific genetic abnormalities. So there's been some research in this area, but still at the moment, we don't quite know what the genetic mutation is. And then we can also have acquired forms of hypocobalaminemia. So this is what we see more often. There is an underlying cause that we diagnose, um, and then secondarily, they have hypocobalaminemia. So We'll, we'll go through these different diseases and explain why it happens, but we do see it often with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. We see it with chronic enteropathies, so we can see it with food responsive, antibiotic responsive, immunosuppressive responsive, and non-responsive chronic enteropathies. Uh, any infiltrative disease that's affecting the ileum, so if you have lymphoma or carcinoma, so disease at the ileum, okay, so which is understandable, the absorptive capacity is less, um, and there's likely destruction of that QBAM receptor. We can also see it with small intestinal dysbiosis, okay? And another one I didn't mention here uh, is the short bowel syndrome. So if a patient needs to go to surgery to remove, uh, let's say the ileocecal-colic junction um, because there was an intussusception, these patients often will have persistent hypocobalaminemia. So possible laboratory alterations that we can see. Um, it is more common in humans. Sorry about that. It is more common in humans um, with Immerslund grosbeck syndrome. And it's been documented in a few papers and a few case series of dogs with this disease. Um, what we can see is a macrocytic anemia. It's due to nuclear inhibition of nuclear maturation. We also can see neutropenia, hypersegmented neutrophils, and sometimes thrombocytopenia. More recently, there was a paper uh, in JVIM 2019 where they looked at two sets of dogs uh, that were anemic, and a sub one section or one group had low cobalamin, the other group had normal cobalamin, and they were trying to see if this macrocytic anemia was common in the low cobalamin patients compared to the anemic ones with normal cobalamin. And what they found that there actually wasn't a big difference in terms of what their red cells looked like. And often uh, they are normocytic, normochromic and non-regenerative. So we don't often, at least in this acquired form of hypocobalaminemia, see a macrocytic anemia. However, it has been reported in dogs with the Immerslund-Grosbeck syndrome, okay? 
We can also see an elevated blood ammonia, and I'll show you a diagram later why we can see that. So some of these patients can have signs like they have hepatic encephalopathy. Um, so measurement of the ammonia can be can be helpful. Um, or if you have a patient where uh, they present and they look like they have hepatic encephalopathy, their ammonia is elevated, but then in the end, let's say their bile acids are normal or you don't find a shunt, you know, it'd be something that we should be checking their cabalamin. And then again, the patients with Immerslund-Grosbach syndrome, they can also have proteinuria, and this will be because the, re the QBAM receptor um, that is not functioning appropriately in the ileum is also present in the kidney, and therefore you'll have some proteinuria because it's not working to help reabsorb protein. So clinical signs that we can see, there is an overlap. Uh, I've done my best to separate them um, because there is slight difference based on what the cause is. So in the acquired form, we will see signs related to the underlying gastrointestinal disease, or if they have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, we'll mainly see the signs related to the underlying cause of the low cabalamin. However, what's important is that we will also see a poor response to therapy. So you will start treating the patient appropriately for, let's say, their um, immunosuppressive responsive chronic enteropathy or for their exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And you will just have a poor response to therapy. Okay. And you might think they need more immunosuppression, but in reality, their cabalamin is low and their poor response to therapy is due to ongoing inflammation or villus atrophy that is occurring um, because cabalamin is needed for maturation of those cells. And then we can also see CNS signs in these patients. So I have seen dogs with chronic enteropathy who do have a very low cabalamin and have an elevated ammonia, okay? Um, and then the, in the hereditary form, we will see a lot of these patients, they're described as a failure to thrive. They have an appetence. They might have vomiting and diarrhea, again, due to the cabalamin um, its importance in the health of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, in beagles, there have been a few case reports and case series on Imerslund grosbeck syndrome and beagles showing that they are predisposed or they seem to get fibrosis and degeneration of their liver and hepatic infections. And then we also can see central nervous system signs, okay? So why is the central nervous system affected? So I hope that you can see my, my mouse. Um, so the central nervous system can be affected for multiple reasons. So we can have an elevated ammonia. However, it's also been shown that there are humans, um, and I think in a cat, where the ammonia was normal. And it is assumed that um, the neurologic signs come from the acid urea, so the methylmalonic acid urea. And so we know that in people, they can have demyelinating neuropathies or dementia due to just the persistence of this elevated MMA, okay? But also we can see patients with an elevated ammonia. So the cobalamin is necessary for this enzyme that we spoke about earlier. And so if this enzyme isn't uh, functioning well, you won't have the development of succinyl CoA for the Krebs cycle, and you have a shift in the pathway to the right. And so our methylmalonic acid will increase. And in the end, that elevation in methylmalonic acid does have an inhibition of carbonyl phosphate synthase, and therefore you will have a decreased conversion of ammonia to carbonyl phosphate, and therefore the ammonia can be elevated in these patients, and they can present like patients with hepatic encephalopathy. So now let's speak about the specific diseases in these patients. So IGS is a rare hereditary autosomal recessive congenital disease. Um, the mutation can result in a defect of one or one of the subunits. So there's two different subunits that make up the QBAM. Um, and so with one subunit, it's been shown to be more common in Australian shepherds and giant schnauzers, whereas with the other subunit, we can see it in beagles. There's also been a mixed breed dog uh, recently uh, published in a, a case report, which is interesting being that it's an autosomal recessive disease. Um, we have seen it in border collies and commodores, okay? And so in these patients, they often will have intermittent diarrhea, inappetence, poor body condition, and failure to thrive, usually within that first year of life. In border collies, they can be a, a little bit older, it's been shown. They can have neurologic signs, um, either due to MMA or an elevated ammonia. A lot of these patients will have proteinuria. And then in beagles, we can see that they have hepatic inflammation and fibrosis. And just out of interest sake, um, 
you know, IGS, it's something where if you haven't heard about it before, it's something that's going to be very difficult to diagnose because the signs are vague, uh, except in this in the beagles where they do have this hepatic inflammation and fibrosis that is thought to be due to increased homocysteine so it's been shown in, in rats that having an increased homocysteine can result in hepatic inflammation and fibrosis and in addition these dogs these beagles were also getting many um fungal infections in the liver so you know having a young beagle presenting to you frequently for you know hepatic fibrosis so inflammation and fungal infections in the liver, if you don't know about this disease, you might not be able to diagnose it. Um, if I recall following diagnosis and treatment, I do think one dog did survive. Most of them did pass away, but maybe that's due to the fact that it was undiagnosed and these, these infections and the liver inflammation went on for too long. But just out of, if you guys are curious, here are um, the two papers if you, if you were to have a look. So there is genetic testing for this disease. So in the United Kingdom, Labaclin can test for the Cubulin um, subunit defect. So in the Beagle, the Border Collie, and the Commodore. And then the other lab that I could find that's in Europe was in Croatia, and they can test for both subunit abnormalities. So you can send blood or a swab to them for, for confirmation of the diagnosis. Now let's speak about the more common diseases um, and causes of hypochromatinemia. So the first one we'll speak about is exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So in about 50 to 80 percent of dogs, 100 percent of cats, they will have hypochromatinemia. Well, based on the studies, they will have hypochromatinemia uh, when they're diagnosed with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. There's quite a few reasons why this can occur. So as I mentioned before, the intrinsic factor is necessary for um, to be complex with cobalamin and then to be absorbed via the receptor in the ileum. And this intrinsic factor is produced and released by the pancreas. And so if you have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, you will have decreased to absent intrinsic factor. It is also thought that this intrinsic factor is species specific and therefore um, when we supplement with the pancreatic enzymes, because it's coming from a different species, therefore it won't work as well. And therefore, you know, are these patients not absorbing their cobalamin? There's also decreased pancreatic proteases to free the cobalamin from the R protein, okay, when that's needed, or it's necessary to happen before it can bind to that intrinsic factor. In these patients, due to the lack of or inappropriate malassimilation, um, you will also have dysbiosis, okay? And dysbiosis, it competes, so the bacteria, they compete with the host to consume cobalamin. And then there's also toxic effects of this dysbiosis on the mucosa of the ileum. So there's inflammation and therefore a lack of absorption, okay? So what's the importance of this low cobalamin? So what we know from studies in dogs and in cats is that it is a it's a negative prognostic indicator, okay? So we do have decreased survival. It's been shown to have decreased survival in these patients that have low cobalamin. It also affects response to treatment. So we do know that you can start treating a patient for their exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And if their cobalamin is low, you probably will have a less positive result with just treatment with the pancreatic enzymes. Um, so it's something that we should check in all of our patients once they're diagnosed based on how frequent it occurs. Um, but also in your patient, if they start having a poor response, it's worth checking their cobalamin. So check and supplement. So with chronic inflammatory enteropathies, but also infiltrative uh, diseases in the ileum, uh, this can occur in six to 73% of cases. We do know that dogs with, well, an older study, um, that dogs with a rather low cobalamin at the time of diagnosis have an odds ratio of 9.5 for a negative outcome. So it is very high. And we know that patients with, so in, a, I think it's two, this year, I think it's 2023 paper, um, we do know that patients with a lower cobalamin have more significant ileal disease. So for me, if I have a patient where I measure the cobalamin and it is low, I do want to get ileal biopsies. So surgically, ideally endoscopically, I do want to access that ileum um, and see how severe the disease is, is there. Uh, suspected causes, so chronic mucosal inflammation can result in decreased receptors and then also the dysbiosis. 
And what's the importance? So as I said before, um, it has, it's a negative prognostic indicator. We know that if it is low, the response to treatment will be less. And that is because having a low cobalamin is necessary for cell function, for mucosal regeneration. And when it's low, we can have villous atrophy, ongoing inflammation and malabsorption. So despite trying to treat the underlying disease, when the cobalamin is low, the health of the gut still isn't good and we need to supplement. And then we have dysbiosis. So um, it's an altered composition or quantity of the intestinal microbiota. You, the bacteria, I think I mentioned it earlier, they compete with the host for the cobalamin, um, thus leaving the host hypocobalaminemic. So when should we be measuring cobalamin? So personally, I measure it if I'm if I suspect or if I'm looking for a congenital hypocobalaminemia. So if I have the typical breed, um, let's say age, that's presenting to me for failure to thrive gastrointestinal disease, I will check or a Sharpe, I will check um, the serum cobalamin. Also in my patients where they have a failure to thrive or weight loss, I think we all have those patients that present for just not having a great appetite, not really growing, um, having some gastrointestinal signs, and I can't really find a reason why. And so I will check the cobalamin to see, you know, is there an actual gastrointestinal disease going on? Um, if I've diagnosed gastrointestinal disease, I will also measure it. It Again, it's important because it's a prognostic indicator. So it's important information to be able to tell the owner. I can also tell if I need to supplement this patient. I also use it to tell, well, should I be getting biopsies of the ileum? Or, you know, is the ileum affected? Or is the small intestine affected? You know, we have lots of cats that present with chronic enteropathy. And unlike in dogs who have diarrhea, most often, these cats often just have some hyperexia or maybe just some weight loss. And the question is, is there GI disease going on? And measuring that cobalamin, if it, and it is found to be low, can be helpful. Um, or if you have a patient that's presenting with signs of colonic disease, they're having hematochesia and they are defecating your know, small amounts frequently. But I want to know, you know, is the small intestine affected? And so I will measure a cobalamin to actually see, is it actually an expel disease? And so Again, when it's low, it can be helpful uh, to get a big, a better picture and understand better what's going on in the patient. <laughs> and then again, successful therapy, it requires supplementation. I also measure it in my cases of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. I will measure it at the time of diagnosis and I will frequently mo monitor it through treatment. Um, again, it's a prognostic indicator, so it's important for the owners to be aware of, as well as that treatment. Uh, the success of treatment requires the cobalamin to, to be normal. So supplementation might be required. And based on the statistics, based on the studies, it seems that it's extremely frequent for these patients to have low cobalamin. And then in patients that have, let's say, metabolic CNS signs or an elevated ammonia, um, and, and other underlying or more common underlying cause has not been identified, I might measure the cobalamin or the methylmalonic acid. We can have discordant results between the serum cobalamin and uh, methylmalonic acid. So you can have a high MMA with a normal cobalamin. And we can see that when, you know, the serum cobalamin is normal, but there actually already is a deficiency at a cellular level. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, in about 12% of dogs with chronic enteropathy, uh, or let's say 20% of dogs that have a low normal cobalamin, they will have an elevated MMA. So although it seems normal in the blood, really at a cellular level, we are starting to have some deficiency. We can also see it with renal insufficiency, with dehydration as well, but those, um, those are false positives. And then as well with primary abnormalities and methylmalonal coa mutase, which is what we assume is going on in those border collies with normal cobalamin elevated MMA or a transport issue. So in humans, it's been shown that they can have a transcobalamin two transporter abnormality. So that is a transporter that takes it in the blood to the target tissue. Um, however, in, so that means that in the blood it's normal, but because it's not getting to the cell and into the mitochondria, the MMA is elevated, but this is not something that's yet been reported in dogs and cats. And we also can have a normal MMA with a low cobalamin. It's a 
we believe that these patients are going to soon have an elevated MMA and that the cobalamin has a higher or longer half-life intracellularly than in the blood. So probably if you follow these cases out um, and don't supplement them with time, their MMA will elevate. Because of this kind of discrepancy, mainly the one where the serum cobalamin can be normal and the MMA still being elevated, uh, which has a higher morbidity for the, for the patient, uh, it is now recommended, at least guidelines say, that we should be treating these patients when their cobalamin is less than 400. So if you recall, the reference ranges for dogs and cats, the bottom end usually is around 250 to 300, okay? Uh, but because of the fact that we can have a, a decent percentage of patients that have a normal cobalamin, but an elevated MMA, and therefore a deficiency at a cellular level, it is recommended that we supplement them when it's less than 400. And if you look at this, this table, or this graph, sorry, um, when you move to the left of the cobalamin, so if you look at the 251 to 350, um, you can see more of these patients are becoming more and more uh, deficient of cobalamin at the intracellular level. Okay, so um, the troubleshoot for that discrepancy, um, and because of the ease of measuring serum cobalamin, if you measure serum cobalamin and it's less than 400, uh, we should be supplementing. So how do we treat these patients? So most important, you need to identify and treat the underlying cause if possible. So of course, if it's hereditary, it's not possible. Um, but if they have EPI or um, you know, chronic enteropathy, we can be treating these patients. And then begin enteral or parenteral cobalamin supplementation and appropriately monitor. Texas A&M, uh, the veterinary school there, does lots of studies on gastrointestinal disease as well as, um, and as well as cobalamin. And if you look on their website, they have guidelines on um, how to measure it, how to supplement it, how to monitor it. And they frequently update these guidelines based on research that's coming out, mainly by them. Um, but it's a, a good resource. And I would say during my residency, it was one that, that I accessed frequently. So first we can speak about parental supplementation. And again, please be aware that the guidelines I'm putting here, although they're often in the textbooks, um, I have taken them directly from the Texas a and guidelines. So there are two different types of cobalamin uh, that we can supplement parenterally, so injectably with. So there's cyanocobalamin, which is often the one that we use in practice. It's inexpensive and widely available, but there also is hydroxycobalamin. It is the treatment of choice in children with IGS, uh, likely because it is the natural form and it lasts for longer. And it is something where they have tried to use it in, I think it was in beagles with IGS, and it was able to keep um, cabalamin elevated, uh, I think for at least two months. Okay. So it's recommended. So there is a, a table, you can find it in the BSAVA formulary. You can also find it on the Texas a and website. It's based on weight and tells us how much cobalamin we should be giving these patients for their injections. And it's approximately 50 micrograms per kilogram subcutaneously. The protocol is that you give one injection once weekly for six weeks. Following that last six weeks, you do one a month later. Monitoring, we should recheck the serum cabalamin after one month. The, sorry, the recheck cabalamin after one month should be super normal. So it should be above the reference range. If the serum cobalamin is within normal limits, injections are often needed every two to four weeks. And if it's actually still low, again, we need to focus better on the underlying cause, see if we can improve treatment, and injections likely will need to be continued weekly to bi-weekly. However, more recently, they've come out with an enteral, so oral supplementation, um, which has been studied extensively in the past few years. So the protocol with this, uh, with the oral medication, is 12 weeks of oral cobalamin supplementation. The dose is about the same, so 50 micrograms per kilogram PO. On the back of the box, it tells you based on weight how much you should be giving. So I think it was a cat or a small dog. It's, well, half every day or one every other day. Um, and then there is one a day and then two a day. So on the back of the box, it will tell you how to supplement them. You recheck the serum cobalamin after one week. So you do 12 weeks. After a week, you recheck the serum cobalamin. If the cobalamin is normal or low, i.e. not high, you continue daily supplementation. 
So as I mentioned, this enteral supplementation has been um, studied extensively in the past six years. So then the question is, is it sufficient enough to uh, correct cobalamin in our patients that don't have the receptors there due to a hereditary deficiency or you know don't have intrinsic factor or have severe disease in the ileum? And you know, is it as good as, better, or sufficient compared to the injectable form? And you know, what we know in dogs and in cats, especially with chronic enteropathies, is that giving them this oral uh, supplementation has significantly improved the serum cobalamin in all cats and dogs at follow up. So, although that doesn't mean that once you stop it, it's going to remain elevated. It depends on the underlying disease and how well it's controlled. So it's something that you still should be monitoring every few months. Um, but we know that it is uh, comparable to parenteral uh, supplementation in dogs with, and cats with chronic enteropathies. Now with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, uh, the only study currently available or currently been uh, performed is in dogs. Uh, but we do know in dogs that in a study of 18 dogs with a cobalamin less than 350, giving them oral supplementation significantly increase the serum cobalamin to normal range or higher in all the dogs. So even though they don't have intrinsic factor or even though they don't have the pancreatic proteases um, to release the R protein, so intrinsic factor combined, giving this oral supplementation is sufficient, okay? And then even in the patients with hereditary IGS, um, so they've looked at it there. And so again, you would think they wouldn't have that receptor but supplementing them, uh, one or these beagles at one milligram um, daily, it actually improved their clinical signs. The serum cal um, cobalamin normalized and the MMA levels normalized. And so with all of these diseases, it's not known, are we over supplementing them? So giving them quite a bit. And although they have decreased number of receptors, it's enough that we're not overloading those receptors with cobalamin and they can absorb enough. Um, or is it that with that 1% of passive diffusion that is available, um, is that enough to maintain their cobalamin? So I don't think we know quite enough yet about why it's working, but it seems sufficient. Or at the moment, we know that it's comparable to giving parenteral um, injections. And, you know, in the end, likely cheaper and easier for the owner to give oral supplementation than having them coming in to your clinic once a week for six weeks and then at a month um, to have injections. So can we give too much cobalamin? The easiest answer is no. So it is a water soluble drug. It's excreted via the kidneys. Uh, so it shouldn't, we shouldn't be able to give too much. However, I guess we can imagine that if you have severe kidney disease, then they won't be able to excrete the cobalamin. However, what we know is that over supplementation or having an elevated cobalamin has not resulted in negative effects or increased morbidity and mortality in any species. So briefly, I would like to touch on hypercobalaminemia. So until recently, we used to think this was a benign finding. A lot of papers would almost ignore that it's elevated. Yes, it's true that a low cobalamin has more morbidity, but that's not to say that having an elevated cobalamin is a not an unimportant finding, okay? So in humans, we know that patients with high cobalamin, a lot of them have cancer or hepatic or renal disease. So more recently, it's been looked into in dogs and cats about if, you know, finding this high cobalamin doesn't mean something significant. And we did see in about two to 30% of dogs, and the most common causes were chronic enteropathy, which is interesting, hepatic disease and cancer. Whereas in cats, it was about 14 to 25% of cats. Um, and again, we see it with chronic enteropathy, pancreatitis, um, gallbladder, liver disease, and, and cancer. So, you know, it's not a benign finding. If you measure it thinking that it's going to be low because they have chronic gastrointestinal disease and you find that it's high, it can be due to their GI disease. Uh, so keep it in the back of your mind that, you know, you do have that value. Yes, it's not something that we need to do anything about, but in my opinion, it shouldn't be completely ignored. So conclusions. 
Uh, I think it's important to understand when we should be measuring serum cobalamin. And so does your patient have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency? Do they have a primary gastrointestinal disease? Or does your patient have an unexplained failure to thrive? Do they have an elevated ammonia or you know, metabolic neurologic signs? Or is it one of these hereditary uh, patients that have hypocobalaminemia or an elevated MMA that you're aware of? We should consider measuring MMA. Um, it's not something that we need to measure very frequently, but I would say in these border collies, if you truly want to diagnose that they have intracellular deficiency or in a patient, um, that you can't explain their metabolic neurologic signs. It might be something that we need to, need to measure. To recommend it again, to start treatment for the underlying condition, if present, um, and then parental or enteral cobalamin supplementation, if it is less than 400, and then institute strict monitoring and follow-up. Um, and again, you know, you monitor the patient, you follow up when it's recommended, you continue treatment if it is not above normal. But also remember that, you know, if you do reach super normal and you stop it, you know, if the underlying disease is ongoing, the patient still has EPI, the patient still has chronic enteropathy, it is something that you should continue to monitor. All right, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jess, for that great session. Really interesting. We've got a question and answer um, box open and I've already got a question in there. So um, what we can answer. I've just sent over as well, everyone, in the chat box, a link to last week's webinar. So if you want to hear uh, the transfusion uh, medicine for anemic cats, then you can catch up there. So with this supplementation of cobalamin, is it possible to over supplement in small animals? Is that a risk that you yeah. need to be concerned about? So again, if you, well, looking on the Texas A&M website and knowing that it is water soluble, we don't think so. Um, so again, I've had patients where I'm supplementing based on the box and when I recheck them, it is low. So we can consider giving them a higher supplement. Um, but for me, having a high cobalamin has not been shown to be harmful. So, so the answer is, is no. And so a lot of our patients as well that I supplement and then I get the result back and it's very high, these patients have no clinical signs. Fantastic. And with this webinar coming out, a few people commented on how tricky it is to get the injectable form at the moment and how tricky. So if they're very used to using the injectable form and, you know, finding it frustrating for these cases, what would your solution be? Um, would you suggest oral supplementation so for, for these me, cases? I would say, I can't remember the last time I gave injectable. It's so I think so the last time I well. gave injectable was when the patient was in the hospital and I think they had already bought a box of the Cabalaplex and it was at home and I didn't want to charge them again for another box. Um, and so while they were in the hospital, because they had had one uh, injection at their vet, I gave them an injection in the hospital. Um, but because we have these papers showing that oral cabalamin supplementation is sufficient, for me, there's really no reason to be having them coming in for injections unless they're not eating their food. Um, mm. And really it's, it's cheaper and it's less stress for the, the patient as well as it doesn't take up you or your nurse's time. So for me, uh, I would stop giving at the moment uh, injectable supplementation. Have you seen Sorry, much, have you seen many cats be averse to it and, and create any food no, aversion? Or I haven't. No. Palatability is good. No. Oh, that's great to hear. I, I always used to hate giving the injection as well because it used to obviously used to sting they used to scream yeah yeah that, yeah it was always horrible <laughs> well I think that's everyone's questions answered so thank you so much for this no problem. session um, thank you very much we have two more sessions um over the next coming weeks so the next session is next Friday at 1 p.m on proteinuria um we hope you can join us then we will be sending through uh, a a like an email after this with a link to the recording so if you do want to share this with any colleagues then please do and if you're coming to London Vet Show we really look forward to seeing you there and hope to join you on the Friday and if you have any cases that you would like to speak to Jess about then she's available for internal medicine support get in touch um, at info at vvs.vet or our website www.vvs.vet but thank you so much for that webinar we really enjoyed that and thank you everyone for coming along thank you everyone have a great day